Hello right. and welcome to Naloxone 101 presented by Jackson County Library Services. I'm Carrie Turney Ross, Adult Services Coordinator. Uh, for our attendees, please keep your microphones muted while the pres presenters are speaking. This program is being recorded. If you do not want to appear in the recording, please keep your camera off. You can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions uh, when there is an opportunity for a question and answer session, uh, or you can use your microphone to ask the questions out loud. Before we get started, I do wanna share some exciting things that are happening at JCLS. Summer reading has officially started and our theme this year is Readers Are Leaders. Everyone can be a leader in their home, community, school, or at work. Reading makes you more empathetic and therefore a good leader. You can join the fun uh, by joining our Beanstack Summer Reading Program Challenge. You can find out more about this at jcls.org slash summer dash reading. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect, reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Today's speakers are Mahmoud Mata, JCLS social worker, and Sarah Smith, RN with La Clinica. And I will go ahead and hand it off to you two and turn off my camera so you can present the program. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, thanks, Carrie, for the introduction. Uh, and good evening to all the attendees. Uh, thank you for coming. And thank you, Sarah, for being here tonight. So I think I'll just get started with uh, our sharing of the PowerPoint. Um, it's been a while since I've used Zoom Pro. So let's <laughs> <do this. laughs> we'll get all, all the features on this one. All right. So as you heard, um, this is Naloxone 101 with myself, Mahmoud Mada, and Sarah Smith, RN, and at La Clinica Birch Grove's facility. She's a nurse case manager there. Uh, she will also have a slide showing um, some of her credentials. So just an introduction to myself. I'm not sure if anyone, everyone's aware, but the library has a social worker, and that is me. Um, so I will give you some background of that I had with uh, naloxone and sort of general harm reduction practices. So I was introduced and trained um, to naloxone by New York City Health. That was like a brief training video. And, um, you know, when I was going to school, they offered it to students. Um, and I carried around a blue pouch, very similar to the one you saw over there. Um, with that introduction, they sort of taught us that, you know, opioid overdose is really an equity issue. I'm not sure if you could see the map there, but basically the areas with the highest concentration of overdoses were both areas with the lowest amount of resources and the least amount of distribution of naloxone, quite, quite ironically, or quite uh, showing causation there a little bit. Um, I also attended the 2019 Opioid Symposium uh, presented by, by New York Academy of Medicine. Um, so learning from providers, doctors, nurses like Sarah about um, how the opioid epidemic started and sort of some mitigation strategies. All right, so you guys might be saying, well, yeah, but that's New York City. This probably isn't happening here in Jackson County, right? And so overdose and opioid use is definitely a local Jackson County issue too. I don't know if you could see that middle graph, but that top gray line there is the, opio the opioid overdose rate for, um, or all, any opioid death rate for Jackson County specifically, where that orange line right below it is the state average. So you could see that our region specifically in Oregon is a higher death rate region, and it's definitely more than the state average. So it's not just a New York City issue. It's not just a national issue, but it's definitely a local issue as well. 
And I just want to introduce this concept because naloxone kind of fits in this framework of harm reduction um, that both me and Sarah kind of follow. And, and this idea that you sort of meet people where they're at. You, you treat people like human beings, regardless of whether they're using or not, and try to figure out ways that you could sort of mitigate harm that comes from using. And certainly death is one of the more harmful events that someone could experience if they're using or the most harmful. So um, naloxone fits into that framework of sort of preventing that. There's a saying that no addict who's died has recovered, right? So they don't, they kind of miss that opportunity. So yeah, naloxone sort of fits in this general framework. All right, so I am going to turn it over to what is <laughs> the most trusted and ethical profession um, in the nation. So, you know, they advised us today in this morning meeting to find good, um, well-trusted sources of information and what better source than someone who represents the most honest and ethical profession, um, Sarah. Um, so I will turn it over to her and her slides. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, yeah, it is really an honor to be a nurse, to tell you the truth. Um, so my grandmother was a nurse, my grandpa was a doctor, and, and um, I guess there's just that, that inspiration. In it. And I think it is an honor to have other people value us in that way. And so we need to kind of um, hold the standard. Just to support something else that Mahmoud said was, um, Jackson County has been in an opioid overdose alert status sent almost every week since last Christmas. So it's, I, I agree with you, it's very um, topical. So um, you can kind of read this, but I've, I've been a nurse at La Clinica since uh, 2002. Um, so yes, I think it's a great place to work. It's a great way to serve people in our community. Um, I got interested in the opioid issue actually in 2005 when we opened our West Bedford Clinic. And that was kind of back in the day when you know, if you had pain, of course you were gonna get opioids. The question was just how much and how often. And that's really kind of that the, the belief system that we had back then. So that's kind of, um, I guess I just wanna say that, that I'm not coming from a place of all opioids are bad for everyone all the time or something. That isn't my experience. Um, and so I also work with a, an organization called Oregon Pain Guidance and we started a naloxone group about six years ago that's still doing quite well. And it has harm reduction people, pharmacists, um, anyway, a variety of people. So next slide. What I'm hoping to address um, this evening is, um, are these four questions. Why does the opioid epidemic keep changing? We notice it does. What about naloxone for you, how to use it and how to get it? Next slide. So this is kind of the look at the change in the opioid overdose epidemic. So back in 1999, you can see that arrow with the light blue box. Um, that is when kind of the overprescribing was catching up with us in the United States. So that light blue line, you, you can uh, notice over the 20 years that it goes up, but then it starts kind of leveling off. But then around 2010, there began to be a rise in heroin-related overdose deaths. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. From working inside the medical system, I could say that um, sometimes people were just sort of brutally cut off. Um, and so they were going into withdrawal or um, maybe their tolerance kept going up and up and they were quite sure that if they could just increase their dose that their pain would get better, which is often not the case. But if you're experiencing a lot of pain, your mind sort of opens to other options. So we did see that second wave start. And then um, very soon thereafter and around 2013, is the rise in synthetic opioids. So that's really referring to fentanyl for the most part. There are other synthetics such as um, methadone and tramadol, but those um, are not really included. And as you can see, the, the black line on the top is, you know, is really going up. And if you look at the, the, um, the purple line, it's really the drug that's driving the overall epidemic. Um, they're kind of going up 
in tandem. Next slide. This is just my way of saying that um, I have a lot of statistics and I hope they're useful to you, but ultimately every number is a person who died and that person had um, family, loved ones, employers, you know, it, none of us is an island. So when we look at numbers, I think it's really important to imagine that human beings um, that left and those of us left behind who grieve for them. Next slide. So um, this is just looking at this odd thing in the United States. So if you look at the, at the bar graphs on the left, uh, there's blue, orange, and gray. And those are um, France, Italy, and the United States. I think I, I can't totally see that, but I think I've looked at that slide so much, I know which ones they are. So, what, so on the left side, those bars are pretty much at the same height. And that is the percent of population that has chronic pain. So we're about the same, these industrialized uh, countries. But on the right, there's those three bar graphs again. But what you see is that the United States, um, in terms of thousands of standard daily doses of opioids per capita, the United States is far and away the one that uses opioids for that. I mean, it's really pretty striking. So um, why would that be? Well. It isn't because it makes people live longer. In fact, we have lower life expectancy in the United States. And some of that is actually related to drug overdose deaths, which are primarily opioids. But um, opioids are the least regulated in the United States in the industrialized world. So there's one problem, right? Lack of regulation. Um, opioid companies contribute to political campaigns. So there's another um, problem. The United States is the only country in the world, except for New Zealand, that allows pharma to directly market their products to people who may buy them. So one thing I've seen in medical care is that people come in and they are convinced that a certain product is going to revolutionize their life. And if the doctor or nurse, nurse practitioner won't prescribe that for them, there's a there's a horrible disconnect there. Um, and so that's certainly been true with opioids that if you, if you would just prescribe enough or do the right surgery or do this other thing, I wouldn't have any pain. But actually it's part of the human condition to have pain. So the question is how we manage that, how we manage our suffering. But anyway, that's my sort of my speech about that. But we do have a lot of reasons in this country um, for us to just super rely on opioids. Next slide. So this is kind of back to the numbers, but what I, what I want to show you is that starting in January of 2015 and then going to um, about 2020. So this, um, this graph is for a much briefer period of time than the earlier graph with the waves that was over about 20 year period. So, so but again, what you can see is the top line, the black with um, circles is going up and the line that's driving that, or the line of drugs that's increasing, the overdose deaths that's increasing is the brown line, which again is synthetic opioids, pretty much fentanyl. So um, even in the last few years, that's, that's really been a primary problem in terms of death. Next okay. slide. So um, I'm showing you this not so much for the map of the United States on the left, the blue one. But if you look at the one on the right, Oregon and many other states are this really like dark red brown. And those are states in which in one year, synthetic opioid deaths increased almost 100%. So Oregon is one of those states with this incredible increase in death driven by that grouping of medications. Uh, yeah, medications and drugs. It's primarily illicit fentanyl, I'll, I'll say, not the pharma-created fentanyl. Um, next slide. Thank you. So this is one way of looking at why would this be the case. So, um, and this is from the Drug Enforcement Administration, and, and it's just saying if you have $1,000 and you invested it in um, opioids that you were going to sell, if you bought heroin, you could make a profit of 4,000 on your 1,000 investment. If you invested that in fentanyl from China, 
you could make almost eight million dollars. So there's there's this um, law that I learned about a couple years ago from a, a doctor, and it's called the Iron Law of Prohibition. And what it means is when you outlaw a drug, and we'll include alcohol in that, what you do is you cr create an incentive for that drug to become as concentrated and powerful as possible, and typically shove the marketing and distribution into organized crime. So like during the alcohol prohibition in the United States, um, gin is going to be a lot more um, profitable than beer, right? Because for the same volume, you're going to get more um, alcohol in gin than you will in beer. So it's kind of the same thing with opioids that fentanyl and carfentanyl and some of the other analogs are incredibly powerful. You can easily send it through the mail. You can send lethal doses through the mail without any difficulty. So every time we um, outlaw things, we tend to actually strengthen the drug that's being outlawed or that class of drugs and also make it more likely that organized crime will kind of take over distribution of that. So that's kind of a whole other conversation in the world of harm reduction about um, decriminalizing drugs, but it's just kind of to show you the incentives we create for something like fentanyl. Next slide. So this is back to Oregon. Um, this is State Unintentional Drug Overdose Reporting System, SUDORS, and it's looking at uh, 2019 and 2020, month over month um, in Oregon. So May is a particularly heartbreaking month there where you can see in 2019, um, the rate of overdose deaths is in blue. And then it's about quadrupled um, as COVID kind of sunk its, its teeth into the neck of Oregonians. So um, you, you do notice for as many uh, months as they have data for, so clear up to November of 2020, that it's just been a much tougher year since COVID affected our behavior. Next slide. So naloxone can be like an EpiPen for people who are overdosing on opioids. Next slide. So people most at risk for dying of an opioid overdose, it would include people on legitimately prescribed pain medication. Um, some, sometimes if people are sick, they have a glass of wine with dinner, it's, it's nothing illegal, it's nothing stupid, but their body gets overwhelmed and naloxone needs to be on hand or we could lose them in that situation. If someone combines um, medications that make them sleepy, especially the anxiety medicines like Xanax or Clonopin, the, in that case, opioid plus Xanax, it's not one plus one equals two, it's more like one plus one equals three in terms of the sedating power, the likelihood that that person will stop breathing. So that's, that's an important um, combination to be aware of. Then people who are already compromised in some way, like um, they have COPD from smoking or something, they already have trouble getting enough oxygen for the activity of their brain and their body. Or people that don't metabolize drugs um, well, licit or illicit, it's still the same kidney and liver activity. Um, if people go into treatment or into um, incarceration and they're unable to get the drug that they're dependent on, they will go through withdrawal and they will also lose tolerance. Once you lose tolerance, then you can use about the same amount that you did previously, but it will overwhelm your body. Um, so that's a way that people die um, as well. Also, um, methamphetamine in our area um, is contaminated with fentanyl. There are, um, you know, pills, bootleg pills or whatever um, that look like Xanax or um, another, another pill, um, but in, in actuality, they have quite a bit of fentanyl in them. And um, it's, it would be easy for that person to be overwhelmed and to have no um, indication that what they were taking was gonna have that type of effect. There are um, beings like a child or a pet that just inherently cannot take, cannot live through a, a dose like um, even Vicodin or Oxycodone, Percocet. They will um, become overwhelmed and they could die. Um, that's true even for buprenorphine, I learned. So that's something to think about is 
whether or not you think anyone's abusing something, there, there are individuals who just can't, they're just too small um, and they could die um, from a small amount of opioid. If someone is sick or, or using alcohol, e not even to, um, oh, I don't know, to a dangerous amount, their body could still be overwhelmed. So those are some situations and people you could think of that will be at risk for overdose. Next slide. Um, this is just kind of normalizing the naloxone, I guess. Um, if someone, you know, we try to have fire extinguishers on hand because our, our homes could um, go up in flames. Um, people who uh, get chest pain regularly have that medication nitro that a lot of people have heard of, and it just dilates blood vessels so that the muscle gets enough oxygen, which kind of averts a heart attack. Um, if somebody finds it difficult to breathe, like COPD, asthma, they need that inhaler to open up their, their airway so that they can breathe adequately. So if someone could stop breathing altogether related to an opioid, then Narcan or, or naloxone would be a sensible thing to have on hand and to know how to use. Next slide. So this is kind of an opportunity and, and in a way it's a sad thing to think about, but most of the time when someone overdoses, there is a, a bystander, or I shouldn't say most of the time, just slightly under 50%. So that is an opportunity though, if we learn how to use naloxone. And, and um, I can just say that I remember when I was a new nurse and I, <clears throat> I felt afraid, you know, like that patients would be having trouble and I didn't really feel adequate to the situation and I would hesitate to walk in that room or to walk up to that person and try to understand what was going on. And um, I learned that I needed to do that anyway, that I needed to step into that emergency. I needed to go see what was going on with that person. Psychologically, it's, it's a bit of a, a little bit of a hurdle. And I think that that comes up with naloxone as well, that if you see somebody in trouble, you don't necessarily know why. So it's like, am I gonna go towards that person you know, calling 911 on the way, but, but um, I just want to give people credit for, for feeling some hesitancy um, with that situation. And next slide. Um, this is a video that it's about three minutes and it explains, I think, really well how naloxone works in the brain. Is it going to work? <laughs> let's see. Let's see if we could cue that up. All right. So, Mahmoud, just so you know, we can't see the video. Okay. Uh, you might need to stop sharing and then right. reshare. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Is that working now? Of rescue medication that yes. reverses the effects of opioids and saves lives. To understand how naloxone can stop and reverse the effects of an opioid overdose, it's helpful to see how opioids work in the body. Opioids are agonists. This means they bind to and activate specific receptors in the body, including the brain, brainstem, and spinal cord. When these receptors are activated, people experience the effects produced by opioids, such as pain relief, euphoria, calmness, relaxation, and slowed breathing. Taking too many opioids causes so many receptors to fill and activate that breathing may become dangerously slow and even stop. This is how an opioid overdose happens. And this is where naloxone can help. Naloxone has a strong affinity to opioid receptors, more so than most prescription opioids and heroin. But unlike opioids, naloxone is an antagonist. This means it attaches to opioid receptors without activating them. So when naloxone is administered during an overdose, it knocks the opioids responsible out of the way and allows breathing to normalize. 
Naloxone can be administered through an injection or a nasal spray. It usually starts working within a few minutes and lasts from 30 to 90 minutes. While one dose of naloxone can reverse an overdose, sometimes multiple doses are needed, especially in cases involving extremely potent opioids like fentanyl or opioids that stay in the body longer than naloxone. Naloxone is very safe in single or multiple doses. It may produce withdrawal symptoms in people with opioid dependence, but it has no abuse potential and cannot cause an overdose. It's important to remember that naloxone is opioid specific. It has no effect on an overdose caused solely by non-opioid substances like benzodiazepines or alcohol. At the same time, people shouldn't be afraid to use naloxone when the cause of an overdose is unknown. If opioids were not involved in an overdose, it won't cause any harm. If opioids were involved, naloxone can save a life. I'm gonna stop the share and go I get back to the PowerPoint. Um, so just to emphasize there, acting as an antagonist, if the person didn't take an opioid, it's still safe to use, right? Yep, it won't, it won't do anything. It's like a miracle. There's, I can't think of any other drug that you could sort of give it to someone when it wasn't appropriate and it still wouldn't hurt them. So that's that can also help us realize, oh, we can step in and use naloxone and not, you know, the worst thing that's happened is put, putting some liquid in someone's nose. So yeah, good point. And even if that, I think I presented at the Central Point City Council, and I think one of the concerns that a council member had was, what if a, a, a child gets it uh, and sort of accidentally uses the, the medication, still safe to use? The naloxone? Mm -hmm. I believe so, but I would like to ask someone that knows more than I do. I think that's a really good question. Um, I'm sure we also would have heard about it, though, because people have been using naloxone. Lay people have been using naloxone since like the mid 90s. But I still think that's a good question. And I'll, I'll chase that down. Let you know. Uh, let's get back to the PowerPoint. I guess. <laughs> I'll do just maybe through the, um, the training video and then check for questions. But I'll just work through kind of that point and then see. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I think we have to get back to the point we were. And here we go. All right. So um, the point of this slide um, is really just to remind us all that death isn't the only thing that can happen when someone overdoses. Like overdosing is really a, a problem of lack of oxygen. So that can mean brain damage. Um, you know, seizures, um, becoming disabled for life. So um, probably don't need to go through all of these, but I just, I think of it as like, you know, here's the overdose in a point in time and here's time and here's death. There's a lot going on in here that has to do with damage to that person. And the sooner we can use naloxone, the less, um, the more damage we could avert by using it. So next slide. So in 2018, the Surgeon General issued the first health, I'll say his first health advisory in 12 years, which was basically asking all of us, you know, community, friends, family, um, healthcare patients to get naloxone and learn how to use it. And it's really kind of viewing it accurately as sort of a superhero or Good Samaritan approach not trying to analyze, does every person in trouble deserve to be helped? Um, that's a rabbit hole. Um, I think if, if people need help, then hopefully most of us would want to um, help that individual and give them another day and maybe they'll make a different choice. So that was kind of from them. And then um, just a few months later, the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, the federal agency also reinforced that and expanded on CDC guidance. So 
um, just that effort to, to get it out there for us. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of in, I guess in the um, same ballpark as um, damage before death. So um, EMS is not instantaneously on site um, for many different reasons. They could be super busy, you could be in a rural area. So this um, study that was published on, in, um, on Medline um, found that the average time for EMS to get on scene was seven minutes, rural settings, 14 minutes, and maybe up to 30 minutes. So we can think of just outside Medford proper, Jacksonville, Sam's Valley, Eagle Point, Gold Hill, all of those are more rural. Some have like volunteer um, departments that, that come, you know, to respond to a 911 call. And permanent brain damage can happen after four minutes and fentanyl has an even quicker onset. So the only chance really is for naloxone to already be there and to already have somebody there that's willing to use it. So it's, um, it's just, I hope, another reason that any of us could consider getting naloxone and being willing to use it. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is the training video. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, um, Mahmoud. Yeah, so I'm just gonna share my slide for video. This one always makes me excited because I think a, a library manager is the first person up here. So yeah, in Portland too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the central library manager at the central library in downtown Portland. I've administered naloxone once. The most recent time I was uh, having a smoke break right in front of my work actually and the individual is just across the street. He was breathing very shallowly. Um, he was uh, not responding. He was unconscious, in and out of consciousness. I remember I was texting my friend, man, there's nothing going on at work today. And then about one minute later, I heard somebody across the street yelling, Narcan, Narcan. And so I went and ran and got the Narcan, and then I ran back across the street, and they were still going, Narcan, Narcan. And I said, Narcan? You know, I was feeling a little hesitant. I had never used naloxone before, but had seen my colleagues use it, and they had all said the same thing. Um, don't hesitate, just go ahead and just go ahead and administer it. You can't do any harm. Like to me, the hardest is the, the moments just before taking action. And once I'm already underway, it's, it's easier to convince myself to follow through. It's easier to like drown out that internal voice of, of doubt. We administered the naloxone and waited for the cavalry to arrive while at the same time keep trying to keep him awake and, and talking to us. You will never know when it might happen and there is probably nothing more important than potentially saving a life. Here are signs and symptoms to look out for to identify an overdose. The person is unresponsive or unconscious and their body is limp. They have slow, shallow, or no breathing. They're making snoring, gurgling, or choking sounds. Their fingernails or lips are turning blue or gray. If you think someone is experiencing an opioid overdose, check to see if they're breathing. Look for their chest, rising and falling. Put your ear near the person's face to listen and feel for breaths. Try to wake the person up by shouting and tapping them on the chest. If they don't respond, call 911 immediately and say someone isn't breathing. I think they may have overdosed on opioids and I have naloxone. Support the person's breathing with rescue breathing and chest compressions. If you're willing and trained, provide rescue breathing for two breaths. Clear the airway, make sure it's not blocked. Place one hand on the person's chin, tilt the head back, and pinch the nose closed. Use a face mask or place your hand around the person's mouth to make a seal and give two slow breaths. The person's chest should rise, but not the stomach. Do chest compressions for two minutes. 
Place heel of one hand over center of person's chest. Place other hand on top of first hand, keeping elbows straight with shoulders directly above hands. Use body weight to push straight down at least two inches at rate of 100 compressions per minute. If they still don't respond, administer naloxone. Naloxone only works on people who have overdosed on opioids, so there is no danger in administering it to someone who hasn't overdosed. To be safe, if a person's appearance matches the signs and symptoms of an overdose, it's best to administer naloxone and wait until emergency responders arrive. If your naloxone kit contains Narcan nasal spray, here's how it works. Hold the device with thumb on bottom of plunger and two fingers around the nozzle. Place the tip of the nozzle in either nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of the person's nose. Press the plunger firmly with your thumb to release the naloxone into the person's nose. Continue rescue breathing and chest compressions as it may take several minutes for the naloxone to come into effect. If the person does not respond within two to three minutes, administer a second dose. Additional doses may be given every two to three minutes until the person responds or emergency help arrives. Stay with the person to monitor their response until emergency medical services arrive. Roll the person over slightly onto their side. Put the person's top hand under the person's head to support it. Bend the top knee. This position should keep the person from rolling onto their stomach or back so the person does not choke if they vomit. If they wake up, keep them calm and tell them what's happened. They'll probably be disoriented, upset, and feel very ill from opioid withdrawal. Signs of opioid withdrawal include body aches and fever, irritability and restlessness, vomiting and diarrhea, shivering and sweating. These symptoms are uncomfortable but not life-threatening. The person should be monitored until emergency first responders arrive or at least two hours after the last dose of naloxone. Again, these are the steps to take to reverse overdose. Look. Check. Call. Breathe. Spray. Stay. Oregon has a law that protects anyone who administers naloxone in a good faith effort to reverse an opioid overdose. The opioid crisis is not, it's it just picking up more steam as time goes on, it seems. And, you know, the best thing we can do to, to look out for one another is to make sure we are preventing deaths that we have the resources and technology and knowledge to prevent. Yeah, it was it was it was intense. The, all of these situations that I've observed also have been pretty intense. But I, I what I've really come to what I've appreciated is that everybody comes together and d d there are you know 30 different things that need to happen all at exactly the same time and people being willing to help and do that teamwork and just um, respond to help another human being. Um, it's really powerful. It's always worth it to save a life. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions or uh, like in the chat or do people want to ask a question? I've got a few more slides, but it's probably a good time to pause. Sure, sure. We could take a moment. I mean, I think some of the important things emphasized in that video, right? Like withdrawal symptoms, someone might be um, uncomfortable, right? But they're not at risk of death right so even if you feel bad of sending someone to that withdrawal kind of state which might be uncomfortable for someone you know you got to consider the alternatives too right yeah and also naloxone wears off so you know um yeah i'm sure if i was disoriented and sick you know you just have to get through that um before somebody could explain things to you but yeah it it is like life and death, so. And also, I think it's important to emphasize how uh, Oregon law kind of protects you if you're using it in good faith, right? Yeah, I have a slide with a, a wallet card from, um, oh, good, Jenna. Yay for chat. <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> 
Well, maybe I should just go through the rest of the slides and then if um, anybody has anything to say, we'll just do it then. Sure. Sure. Oh, that's great. Yes, here's the famous wallet card um, for the Good Samaritan Law, and it it um, is a little more specific, right? Like you can't be arrested or prosecuted for possessing drugs or paraphernalia, being someplace where drugs are used, violating pro probation or parole. Um, I don't need to read the whole thing to you, but the idea is to um, just to encourage people who are directly with others who may be using to. Um, to not hesitate to call. I have asked people in our area like, okay, this is what the law says, but are you finding that law enforcement is arresting people anyway or hassling people? The last time I asked that the answer was universally no, but I haven't asked that in a while. So um, MPD has, gosh, carried naloxone for four or five years. They've saved so many people. So it would be to me a big disconnect if they simultaneously arrested people, but um, I'm always interested in what's really going on. Um, yeah, so public health in Benton County um, developed this as a wallet card. And I think it is, you know, kind of reassuring for people. Next slide. So how to get naloxone. Um, so really you can go into any pharmacy and ask the pharmacist to, are you lifting a Max's mission thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Max's mission, definitely. So at a public training or go on their uh, website and they will mail naloxone to people. Um, That's how I got my account. They mailed it um, right to yeah. my door and it has instructions. It comes with a rescue breathing kit too. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, so breathing is so important and it's, it's a whole story about infectious disease when you're breathing. I, that's probably a whole conversation, but having that face shield that, and it has a one-way valve so that your air is going in, but, but the person's air as in, you know, potentially vomiting um, is not coming back. So it's, it's a really good tool, that thing. Um, so yes, Max's mission, go online, go to a training, International Overdose Awareness Day is uh, the last, I believe, last Saturday in August at Hawthorne Park in the afternoon. There'll be um, booths and trainings and that kind of thing. I'm sure it'll be on the Max's Mission website soon if it isn't there now. Um, let's see. Well, just um, so you can go into a pharmacy and ask the pharmacist to um, dispense it to you. In reality, they will prescribe it to you, which means that your insurance will cover it. But as far as you can tell, asking the pharmacist, they aren't prescribing it to you. So it's just important because you can get your medication paid for by your, your insurance company. If you have to pay cash for Narcan, it's around $150. Um, the vial and syringe setup, um, I'm sort of guesstimating anywhere from 10 to $20, so much less expensive, but not everyone is comfortable you know, drawing up medication and using a syringe to put it in someone's muscle. So there's that. So I think the Narcan is more appealing to most, most people. I um, also wanted to say that uh, Max's Mission has their red boxes that are throughout the county too. So if it was a real emergency scenario um, and you need to get it, go to their website, they have the location of those boxes. Um, yeah, and all, all of the libraries will have them, right? And Birch Grove has- We're hoping, yeah, one. yeah. We, we still need to uh, work out some last parts of the agreement, but when that's live, we'll definitely let our, our patrons know that the library will yeah. have those. And then we'll all know more what the red box is. So that's really great. Um, yeah. And you don't have to break into it, nothing like that. You lift the lid and take the kit and rescue someone. So. And I know Max's mission has been doing some training at hotels, which is a place that people overdose fairly often. Um, so there's, there's a lot of groundwork and um, the county has uh, operates a syringe exchange. It's not a great many hours per week, but it's way better than nothing. 
HIV Alliance teams up with them. They've been doing it outdoors um, since COVID became such a, a factor. And H HIV Alliance distributes throughout, um, I think about five counties, at least five counties. Um, so OHP covers it completely. Um, copay, if you have private insurance, is probably going to be $20 to $30. Um, someone asked a question in the, the chat, Sharon, who can purchase and how do you do it? Um, anyone, it's legal for anyone to possess naloxone and to buy it. You don't, you don't have to have it prescribed. And most states in the United States um, have the same legal situation. It's just such a public health problem that you can go in and ask for it. The expiration is typically 24 months after it was manufactured. Um, so like any other medication, it probably isn't going to be that exact day, but you should have, you know, 18, 20 months on the medication. Um, and I guess there's just two more slides, I think. The next one is the orange looking one, just, just to say that basically what naloxone does is let people breathe. It doesn't have an opinion about drug use or opioid pain medications or illicit fentanyl. It's just, that's all us. What Narcan does is let people breathe. And I think there's a last, a last one. Yes. Oh. Mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, help this little guy have his parents and grandparents live, you know? I mean, we're all connected that way. So that's all I have. Yeah, we'll take some time to open up to discussion and question, I think, as well. So I have a question, Mahmoud and Sarah. I understand that the two of you have, um, like Mahmoud, you were just holding up that uh, little packet, that little, not packet, but package. Um, and some of those might be available for people who have attended this program to pick up. Is there a good way for them to get that from you? Could they possibly email either of you and, and say, hey, showed up this program um, and pick it up the library? How, how does that work? I know we have the red cases for the naloxone, um, but the pinch there, of course, is that it doesn't have naloxone in it. It's to help you carry your naloxone. So I would just recommend that people um, uh, do what we had in the presentation and probably go to the Max's Mission website and just you just fill out a form and they will send you the, the kit. Um, and also... Um, Maybe while Mahmoud is talking or something, I'll go get a different kit that I got from HIV Alliance of, for a different form of naloxone. So the good thing that those red boxes have, and they could, if someone is interested in getting the red box, which has everything but the actual medicine, but it, it does have instructions. It has the, the rescue breathing, like plastic thing, sheet or whatever. It has also a list of pharmacies that do carry naloxone. So if you are an OHP subscriber, you know, those will definitely be available and we're happy to give those out. Again, they have everything but the actual medicine. In them. Okay, understood. Bummer, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the kit that I have, um, I'm not quite sure where it is, but it's a plastic um, container and it's actually a, a needle disposal container. And so when, when you flip it open though, this is from HIV Alliance, there's two vials, two syringes, alcohol wipes, a breathing barrier and instructions about how to use. So it's the intramuscular kind. And for anybody that has a reasonable comfort with um, you know, injecting, then uh, including into muscle, somebody gets a, medi a medication uh, testosterone or something, and it's it's always given intramuscularly. So, if someone's comfortable with that, and it's it's a real great way to safely dispose of of needles too. So that's what HIV Alliance usually they often give out. It depends because they also give out the auto injector and the nasal. So I think it depends on the on the setting which one they give out. Yeah, couple, uh, sorry. sorry, I don't know what the echo is coming from, but. We have a, a couple of questions in the chat here. We have Sharon who asks, where do we get more training? Um, and we also have Jenna who asks, curious about the law that uh, 
does not does not charge the person experiencing overdose as well as the bystander? Does that expire at all? Like once the person's life is not in danger, are they then charged? Or is that a bit beyond your wheelhouse? I asked um, Lieutenant, I think it was Kerry Curtis. He's the head of MADGE, or at least he was at the time, which is Medford Area Drug and Gang Enforcement. Um, and he said that they don't arrest on the scene like that. That's that um, your question, Jenna, makes perfect sense. But he said that they weren't doing that. I think it would just depend. I mean, if somebody is overdosed by a big pile of fentanyl, I imagine someone's going to get arrested, you know. But if it's just just your common, sadly common overdose, I understood from him. Um, but that's that's another one, like the child question. It'd be interesting to ask somebody currently what's going on. And getting more training, um, there are many good training videos on YouTube. Um, there's another one. Well, actually, on Max's mission, they use a different um, training video from Oregon Health Authority, um, which is the same entity that made the one that we showed. And I, I, I just like the one that we showed better. But if you went on YouTube and you just Googled um, naloxone training, you could pick the type that you're interested in and you might end up watching a couple and get something different out of each one. So there's some good ones out there. And also, I, I think that just, you know, for me, I have watched it so many times that it's helped me feel like, yes, I could do that. And I think that's true of any of us, that the more we watch something, the more, that's why we do CPR training every other year is because we need muscle memory in an emergency. So I think this, could benefit people too. Yeah, I think it's important to emphasize, like when I did the training in person with New York City Health, like they were very comfortable with just showing us like a training video. And so it's not like the most technical process, especially if you use the nasal spray. So um, some of it will be like a little bit of hesitancy too. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very like bystander approachable. Um, it's not, the learning curve's not like very great to use it. Yeah. I have another question. Um, when someone were, if someone were to get the, the kind that can be injected, does that medication need to be kept at a certain temperature or can you just carry it around in your pocket? You can carry almost any naloxone around that way. That's a good point. They, um, they're on any medication, you'll see like what they call temperature excursions. So they might tell you, keep it at room temperature or don't do this or don't do that. So um, the, the Narcan now actually has a red plunger. It's what they're calling the Gen 2 product. And they added, they changed, changed an excipient possibly to get a new patent, but we won't go there. Um, but so anyway, so that it could um, officially be use, used outside temperatures. But there is some good research that's been out for a while saying that um, Narcan naloxone is good outside of the, of the dates it's still effective and it's still effective outside temperature range. So we usually just tell people like, don't throw it away. You know, you're welcome to get new stuff, but don't throw it away because it, it will still be effective um, using the FDA's definition of effectiveness. So, um, so yeah, just keep it with you at all times. <laughs> Strap it to your leg. <laughs> So I was wondering if you could address some of the most current trends with COVID and like, what do you think are some like compounding factors that are leading to those like increases in deaths that we've seen in the most recent? Um, I think, you know, I think being isolated, I think um, people tell me that many more people were using alone and so there's like no chance for resuscitation. Um, I think those are probably the main things is just being divorced from a support system, using a loan, um, just, you know, we have these deaths of despair, you know, that the two, um, I think they're Princeton economists, Case and Dean, but they, 
kind of started that phrase where U.S. life expect expectancy was going down even before COVID because of the so-called deaths of despair. So that's drug, alcohol, and suicide deaths. And there's just so many, I mean, there's economic displacement that's part of that. There's race is an aspect of that. So I don't know, I would just, that's just my, my stab at it. What do you think with COVID? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of like social factors also increase your overdose risk. You know, there are economic factors, definitely what you mentioned, using alone and not with people. Yeah, it's, and also access to fentanyl can't be like, uh, is another thing and, and fentanyl being cut in other drugs too. Yeah, there's these pills called M30s that I learned about and they look like oxycodone 30s, but they're actually mostly fentanyl and the um, drug and gang enforcement, you know, people are aware of them, but also in a medical um group I've participated in that one of the um, doctors was trying to figure out what to do because it had a, you know, the, his patient was using those and there were some very, you know, frightening consequences to that. One of the things that um, like HIV Alliance and Max's mission do is give people, you know, in certain settings, the fentanyl test strips. So that's how people are finding out. It doesn't tell you how much is in the drug, but it could say to you, Oh, I thought this was just meth, but actually it's both. My understanding is that most of the meth in our area is contaminated with fentanyl. So if it does, if it makes somebody slow down or use with somebody else or, you know, do a test first, you know, whatever, whatever that could be, if, you know, if someone would be appropriately hesitant, um, that could help. So those are the kind of things that fall under this harm reduction umbrella, right? Like test strips, use less, use in a monitored area. These are all things that with the naloxone kind of generally fit under that. Syringe exchanges, obviously too. Definitely. Nalox boxes. <laughs> well, it is now six o'clock. I'm gonna share my screen for just one moment. Let me see. So I wanted to share a book list that I created for this program. And to get to that, you can go to our catalog. You go to jcls.org, click on catalog. <laughs> and to find lists, if you go to this drop down section, um, the options are like library catalog, articles and databases, and in lists. You can just go in lists and type in the lock zone and search, and you'll find Naloxa 101, 101 and the opioid crisis. And this list contains some books about, um, some that specifically do talk about naloxone, um, but a lot of these are about the opioid crisis in general, how we got here, and who it is affecting. Um, spoiler alert, it's everyone. <laughs> and so uh, if you want to further your learning on this topic. These are some good places to start. And of course, like uh, Sarah and Mahmood said, uh, YouTube videos on training uh, is also a great place to go. Um, and then just to wrap it up, I mentioned summer reading uh, front and center here on our website. If you just click on that, you can get started with your Beanstack account. Uh, by attending this program, you've attended a summer reading program, and that's one badge that you can earn through Beanstack, and that gets you one step closer to earning prizes, um, or, or earning, um, yes, you can earn a prize, and you can also uh, be entered into the grand prize drawing. If you're not uh, one of those who wants to do the Beanstack digital version, you can download a reading log and participate in the um, analog style and just turn in your printed reading logs to the library. So I will stop sharing.
And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank Mary you, Carrie. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for the attendees. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Carrie. All right. And everyone have a great evening. And I hope you learned a lot. I know I definitely did. And I appreciate uh, what I'm taking from this. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Bye.